I would encourage all of you to look at the special ex 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 exhibit on the entrance floor. It's an exhibit of the history of the Holocaust, uh, which many of you study in your history class, but it's really very, really well done. And in the upper right hand corner is some notation uh, that uh, Jews were sent from 22 different nations around Europe and even from Northern Africa to concentration camps in many, many places throughout uh, uh, Europe, in, in Poland, in Germany, uh, in other places. The biggest single group that was identified uh, for transport from where they lived to uh, different prisons were Hungarians. Six 100,000 Hungarians were taken from their homes all over Hungary, which is, of course, in Eastern Europe, to different concentration camps. And what that meant was there was an announcement, next Tuesday, uh, you, you, you line up in a certain street, you're allowed to bring one suitcase, so you have to decide of all the things you have in life, what are you gonna put in this one suitcase? You have no idea where you're going. Uh, uh, in many cases, they say, we're gonna relocate you to a different place or a better place. Uh, and you have the clothes you're wearing and that one suitcase. Uh, in some cases, it's the whole family. In some cases, uh, it's uh, only part of the family. So on May 24th, 1944, uh, this young lady, who was a teenager, uh, lined up on a street in her town in Kasha, which is near Budapest, un not knowing what she's going to do. Now, how many of you are 15, 16, or 17 years old? Wow. Okay, wonderful. So now, so now imagine if you're a girl who's 15 or 16, one of the most important things is your sweet 16 birthday, and you imagine what kind of cake you're going to get, what kind of party you're going to get, uh, the fun you're going to have. Uh, this young lady instead uh, gets put on a cattle car, a wooden car with how many people? 50, 60 people Just smashed in. in. And instead of a birthday cake, she has a loaf of bread. And it takes two weeks of travel from her town to Auschwitz prison in, in, in Poland. And when she gets there, many of the people in the car have already died. And the doors open and she gets out. And there's a long line of passengers from other trains, from other countries. And you line up and you go down. And there's somebody at the end of the line, a little man, who's going like this points to you, go right, points to you, go left, points to you, go right. And she's trying to figure out what does that mean to go right or go re left. And maybe, maybe he's trying to figure out who is sick and needs, needs medical care, uh, who is strong and, and can work harder. And the problem is just when she gets there, he goes like this to her mother, and her mother goes on the right line. He goes like this to, to Edie, she goes on the left line. And then he goes on, like this to her sister, her older sister Magda, is beautiful, but she's very frail. And so now Edie is here, and her mother and sister are there, and she knows that's not good, that she, she wants to be with them. And she tries to ask the guards, and of course, they're German. They, they don't speak English, she doesn't, she, they don't speak Hungarian, she doesn't speak German. And she figures, I have to do something at least to get my sister with me, because even though her sister was older, uh, Edie had become uh, her younger caretaker. So what she does is remarkable, and she'll tell you in her own words in a minute. She was not only a ballet dancer, but a gymnast. And what she does is, she does cartwheels from the one line to the other line. The guards are all confused. She tells her sister, Magda, come with me. Sister does cartwheels, that get in the other line. And they, they go into separate buildings. The little man making the decision was a man known as Dr. Mengele. Uh, infamous Dr. Mengele. And the decision he was making, if you go right, you go right into the crematorium and get burned alive. If you go left, you go into the slave labor camp. And that's what happened. Her mother got killed, got murdered that same day, but she saved the life of her sister. So what I'd like her to share with you, uh, and we've been friends for many, many years, is what was it like to be a hero in hell? We've heard stories about heroes in many places, but now you're going to be in a place where everything, almost everything, is taken from you. Your clothes, your history, your ident everything virtually, your identity, your number. In fact, they told her, 
you're so, so weak, you're going to die soon. It doesn't even pay for us to waste the ink to put a tattoo on you. But everybody else is just a number. And so how do you, A, survive? How do you survive physically, psychologically? And then how do you do what she's done is to go beyond being a survivor. And now in San Diego, California, where she lives, she has an office. She treats people, women who've been abused, who are survivors, not to be survivors, but how to thrive in life. And with that, I want to give you my dear friend, my older sister, <laughs> Edie, Go Edie Eager. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let me do a little experiment. Would you be so kind and get up? Thank you. And now, would you be so kind and sit down? <laughs> My question is, why did you do it? Because I asked? Why? I can't hear. Because I'm a nice person and I asked you very nicely, yes? Can you repeat and add? Curiosity. Curiosity, we're obedient. Okay. The truth is that you chose to. You see, I cannot make you want to get up. And I'm going to really talk about that. I cannot make you want to do anything. I cannot teach you anything unless you have the desire to learn. I'm hoping that you're going to be with us now as I'm going to tell you that if you go home now and you find that everything has been taken away from you, your iPhone, God Almighty, <laughs> uh, everything is, your whole world is in the iPhone. All, all that is taken away from you. What are you going to do? I'm going to tell you that it's easier to die than to live. I'm going to tell you that statistics will prove to you, scientists will tell you that, who are into numbers, that a lot of people died before the Nazis even got to them. That's how strong our mind is. And mostly people who died were people who were really not allowed to have any discomfort, that everything was taking care of them. And this is what I like really to be a good definition of a victim who's always waiting for somebody to come, especially little children, we call them charming manipulators. You always wait for somebody to finish your homework or somebody is going to do it for you. But most of all, that you put your whole happiness into someone else's hand. And I think that's dangerous. So I like to really kind of be your mommy, your grandma, and great grandma. So I have three children, I have five grandchildren, and I have three great-grandsons, and that's the best revenge to Hitler. Mm -hmm. There you go. I also like to tell you, our time is so limited for me to be very much in detail, that I was liberated May 4th, 1945, by the 71st Infantry, and I got M&Ms, and I was very ill, and I was in a hospital, and I had a bald head, and I had five kinds of typhoid fever. They told me I weighed 40 pounds. I don't know, but my teeth were separated from my gums. Just to give you an idea, my lungs were filled with water, and I wanted to die. After I'd been through all that, and that's what happens when people are depressed. When you get up, you don't say what, you say what for. I had nothing to get up for, and I wanted to die. And imagine if I would have. I wouldn't be here sitting with you celebrating, yes, my 87th birthday on September 29th, and I wouldn't be able to, yes, thank you. So please, please. Please, precious young people, 
you know, you will want to choose death over life. But when you have a dark night in your soul, call me. Call me, honey. Because you never know what's waiting for you. But what kept me alive in Auschwitz was my curiosity. I always wanted to know what's going to happen next. And that's the childlike part in me. Not the childish part. I want, I need, I gotta have. No longer the childish. But what happened that I was called upon to take care of my sister and I had to really make sure every day that I was not just thinking of the me, me, me. And that's what we are having here in Flint. We are together now. And this is, I do have that dream. When I came to America penniless, my late husband's family was the wealthiest in Czechoslovakia. But when a communist came, they put him in jail. And uh, I don't say as a survivor, why me? I don't have time for that. I said, what now? So I packed up. I went to the jail. I took off my big diamond ring. I put this in my little girl's diaper. And I, I smuggled my husband out. And that's how I came to America penniless. Didn't speak a word of English. The Red Cross gave it to me. And I worked in a factory doing piecework, getting off cuts of, you know, the faster I worked, the more money I made. It was one of those sweatshops. But when I went to the bathroom, one of them said colored. And after Nazi Germany comes Russia, I felt, oh my God, there is prejudice. Prejudice means to prejudge. I figured it out right away, and I always went to the colored bathroom. We just heard it, a wonderful speaker, before that we are what we do. And I took it upon myself to get to know the people who introduced me to the NAACP. I was able to go and work with them and march with Martin Luther King and commit myself to see how you and I can hold hand in hand and form a human family so can finally survive on this planet. So Auschwitz has given me an opportunity to become the survivor and not the victim, but we needed each other. Uh, when I danced for Dr. Mengele and he gave me a piece of bread, I shared it with my friends, and cooperation was the name of the game, not competition, not domination, because all we had was each other then, and guess what? All we have is each other now. And I'm going to talk about Flint wherever I go. I'm going to hear about Flint when I go to, to um, Minneapolis next month. I don't even know where I'm going. I am, but I know I'm going to Germany in March. And I'm going to speak about this community of yours, how you turn something so tragic that happened to you. How do you cope with the unexpected? How do you talk with the unanticipated? And Auschwitz, I, we were told we're going to Hungary to work. And then all of a sudden, I saw Arbeit macht frei. Make, works makes you fear, so we never know what's going to happen next. Stress is good. It's the salt of life, San Celia said. But distress is when you don't know what's going to happen next. When we took a shower, we never knew whether gas is going to come out or water is going to come out. But all we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now. Thank you. You're amazing. You're the best audience. Thank you for being with us. Um, Dr. Philip Zimbardo, um, as you know, he is, if they're going to give a Nobel Prize ever for psychology, this is the man who is committing himself, being here in Flint. And my granddaughter, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago, went to the conference and said, Grandma, I cannot get to Dr. Philip Zimbardo because people are lining up on the street to get to him. <laughs> and that's the guy that you have here. I also want to tell you that he called me uh, a while ago, and uh, I was actually with a patient who went to the bathroom, and I picked up the phone and said, Edie, I am in Auschwitz. I said, Philip, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm lecturing on the psychology of evil. 
please. I said, what can I do? Said, you know what? I found a little stone and I didn't bring it with me and please forgive me. I found a little stone. Can I be a stone in your pocket and take me to Auschwitz? So I think that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking your precious little hands and I'm taking you on that journey that truly changed my life. And I'm gonna tell you that there are no problems in the world, there are only challenges. There are no crises in the world, there are only transitions. There are only transitions. You know, women come to me going through the menopause, I say, well, you can't have any children, but who wants to have children by that time? You know, you still want to recognize that everything in life is a challenge. And we are in that wonderful beginning. I, I love that idea of rebirth and the renaissance and the new beginning, and I'm part of this. I mean, nothing gives me more joy than being with you. I'm totally fired up that I'm counting on you children because you are the future and you are. I'm going to really call every one of you the ambassador for peace and goodwill. We, we had enough communism, we had enough fascism, we had all kinds of isms, you know. You can kill the terrorists, you can kill the communists, you can kill the fascists, but you cannot kill terrorism and fascism because that's an idea. And the best way to conquer an idea is to think of a better idea. And we got here the better idea, don't we? Yeah. And when my, yes, 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 yes. You know, I need to tell yourself, yes, I am, yes, I can, yes, I will, because survivors say a lot of yeses, rather than I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it. The do's and the yeses. My mom told me in a carol card that I tell every student when I ever speak uh, in every school, that she hugged me and she said to me, and I quote, we don't know where we're going, we don't know what's gonna happen, just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And many, many years later, when I worked with two paraplegics coming from Vietnam, and one of them was in a fetal position, why me, and cursing everything, come to regard, conversely, the other one said, you know, Doc, it's very interesting. I am sitting in a wheelchair and I don't really realize how fortunate I am that I was given a second chance in life, that I can see my children's eyes much closer. And I'm sitting there with a the white coat, Dr. Eager, Department of Psychiatry, and feeling completely like an imposter because I ran away completely from my past. I didn't tell anyone I was in Auschwitz oh, at least 20 years. And I graduated with honors, but I never showed up for my graduation because I said to myself that I don't deserve it. I not only had survivor's guilt, I had survivor's shame. And those two paraplegic made me realize that I couldn't take them further than I have gone myself, and I made a decision to go back to Auschwitz, to go back to the lion's den, to look at the lion in the face and reclaim my innocence, and finally beginning to forgive myself that I survived. So this is the kind of journey that I like to really tell you where I've been, but you know, I go through the valley of the shadow of death, but I don't camp there or set up household there. I will never forget what happened. I may not overcome what happened. I came to terms with it. I think there is a difference. I call it my cherished wound. And I cherish that part because that's what gave me not to be the strong woman, but the woman of strength. And my word comes from inside out, not the outside in. The more dependency, I guarantee you, the more depression you're gonna have. Is that okay to go in that way, this way? It's a good start, yeah. it's a good start. It's a good start. Um, 
so uh, why were you as a younger sister uh, the caretaker of your older sister Magda? Magda was the sexy one. <laughs> Magda was the pretty one. And you? And I was the runt. Because after two girls, my parents wanted a son and I came along and I was cross-eyed. I was different. And I thought being different means inferior. You see, honey? And that's why I'm telling you, young people, don't wait for someone else to define who you are. That's very dangerous. You're talking to a, to a world-famous psychologist here, and he's going to tell you that's all projection. Because if I feel stupid, I'm going to call you stupid. And the bully is a coward, and the bully likes it when somebody is scared. That gives them power. And it, we're going to stop bullying. I do, I do a lot of lecturing on bullying myself. But you see, the Nazis were brainwashed. And we, they were told that Jews are cancer to society. And I also point out that genocide is as we speak. I'm very much committed. And I work very hard. I've been to Zimbabwe and all over the world about uh, to stop the genocide. But one thing, this is different because never in the history of mankind such a systematic and scientific annihilation of a group of people existed because after one day, 15 people who were highly educated were celebrating that now they can put 10,000 Jews in the oven in one day. And that's the truth. So, you know, if you kind of are angry at someone, uh, just remember, they're not suffering, you do. So there is a Nazi in every one of us. There is the Mother Teresa in every one of us. Uh, one of my mentors was uh, Abraham Maslow, who talked about the polarities, how we pull it together and not to be a black and white, all or nothing person, but to be able to be a survivor, and survivors are flexible, not rigid. So I do a lot of studying as to what is, what co constitutes a survivor's personality versus a victim's personality, and never blame the victim. You have to be very sensitive about that. And, and so, what kinds of things could you do to help your sister? Because you're limited in what, limited in what anyone could do. You have very little freedom in Auschwitz. I, I think what we did in Auschwitz, we created anything that would help us. We always talked about food. How you make a chicken paprikash, how do you do this? And, and we were counting how many caraways is and how we're going to really eat and eat and eat. And this is what Abe Maslow said about the physiological needs. But my sister had a tremendous need, even today. Even today she calls me and tells me I'm gorgeous. And I gave her compliments every day when we were completely shaven and we stood there in our nakedness, and she looked over and asked me, how do I look? That's a real classic Hungarian question. How do I look? And I had a choice, and you have the choice now, whether I would point out to her that she looked at best like a naked little dog. But I pointed out to her not what she lost, but what she still has with her, and I told her, Magda, you have beautiful eyes. And I didn't lie. I just picked something that I could compliment her that she still had. So if you talk to someone, you may want to ask yourself, is it kind? I like kindness a lot. I like kindness. But then you have to give up the need to be right all the time. I work with couples and families. and. And this is what I do. I am in private practice. And I'm just so happy to be here and so very pleasantly surprised meeting such beautiful people as you are. You're so wholesome. You're dedicated. You're committed. We're going to put you on the map. I know I will. <laughs> I will.
<laughs> Flint, Michigan, that's where you want to learn how to have brotherhood and sisterhood and how to really, how to empower each other with our differences. That I can be I and you can be you, but together we're going to be much stronger than me alone and you alone. So uh, when you and, and your uh, sister um, inmates are imagining these incredible meals, what were you actually eating? What did you, you have for breakfast, lunch, dinner? We were constantly eating. We were going, we going to bake a seven-layer Hungarian chocolate cake. And we were salivating, uh, eating and eating and eating. And when it's going to be a holiday, of course, when Hitler dies. And I, I tell you one thing. I had a boyfriend, the kind of boyfriend that we had a book club together. We talked about Freud and this kinds of um, relationship. No hanky-panky like today, and I was 16. <laughs> yeah, it didn't touch me, no, no. But I did get 16 red roses for my birthday. And we were going to get married, and we're going to go and have our plan. And this is what happened. When I was in a cattle car, he found me somehow through this, this little opening, and he said to me, I never will forget your eyes and your hands. And imagine, I said to myself every day in Auschwitz, if I survive today, then tomorrow I'll be free. That tomorrow I'm going to be Eric. Imre was Hungarian, I think it's Eric. That I'm going to, I was always in the tomorrow. It, that helped me. Um, if I survive today, I'm going to see him tomorrow, and I'm going to show him my hands, and I'm going to show him my eyes. That kept me going every day, every day. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. When I came home, he was the first thing I looked for, and I found out that he was shot a day before liberation. And um, again, you see, we don't, we don't grieve over what happened. We grieve over what didn't happen because when my granddaughter was born, Lindsay Catherine in San Diego, the pediatrician examined her and said, this little girl is flexible. She might become a ballerina. And I said, great, now I can die. Now I have three generations. <laughs> and, uh, and Lindsay did become a ballerina. She went to a beautiful school called Bishops in La Jolla. And she came to me when she was 16 and said, I want you to buy me a dress so I can go to my dance. And I'm a big sucker. I mean, I mean believe me, mm -hmm. I bought her the best dress I could see. I think it was a Laura Ashley. And I came home, and out of the blue, I was crying. I didn't understand why am I crying. The word understand is very academic. I never understood why Dr. Mengele, you know, kept me alive. Why me? I don't say why me anymore. I say, what now? So I remember that I came to the realization that I didn't cry because Lindsay went to a dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. I think all therapy is grief work. Not what happened. But the teenage years I never had. I never had a boyfriend, and I dumped him, and I had another one, and I dumped him. <laughs> I, 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 I never had that experience. And what keeps me young today, that I live in a present, because I can only touch you now. So see, see whether you're taking yourself in the future or trying to blame someone what happened in the past. And I hope that you're going to also live in the present. That's what keeps me young. And I'm pretty ageless, I want you to know. <laughs> I'm pretty ageless. I'm not old. I'm getting older and wiser. I'm very selective who's going to get my anger. And I'm very selective, really, truly. The kind of people that I like to be around, people who somehow find hope in hopelessness. I was teaching in a ghetto 
uh, with Mexican children who had all kinds of um, ways of forming the gangs and gangs and gangs. And I taught them about the brain power, which is the best power. So I'm very fortunate to be able to join the healing arts profession and to be here with you today. And I wanna do so much when I die, when I'm gonna be on my deathbed, I know I'm gonna be very satisfied that I came and I was for something and for peace. One of the wonderful speakers pointed out to be for someone, oh, Mother Teresa, that I'm for peace. I did meet Mother Teresa, and I want you to know she is a very strong woman. She was in La Jolla. This is true story. She was in La Jolla, and five doctors took care of her. And she woke up from one of the procedures, and she asked Dr. Klein, do you know about my Jesus? And Dr. Klein is stammering and stuttering and doesn't know and said, you know, Mother Teresa, I don't know if I know you, Jesus, because I'm Jewish. And she said, that's wonderful because my Jesus is Jewish too. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so, so here we are here today and whatever you believe in, it's not as important, but if you have faith that somehow all is gonna work out well in Flint because you are giving birth to this wonderful hero concept that you're showing up here. You could be in a bar right now falling off the bar stool, but you see you're choosing to be here, and I'm so happy that I am able to be part of it. Now, so. tell us about um, how even a Nazi guard who was instructed to brutalize uh, Jewish prisoners could you. also be heroic. Thank you. Yeah. So wonderful yeah. to bring up. You see, I was taken out to Auschwitz in December. I stood in line to get my tattoo. I didn't get it um, because they told me I'm going to the gas chamber. And so I was taken out of Auschwitz in December that the worst things happened. We were carrying ammunition on the top of a train, thinking that the British wouldn't bomb, but they bombed anyway. I was so close to death because the, the train stopped and I was the first one to jump and go to the forest. My sister wasn't there. In the middle of the bombing, I ran back. Magda fell. Magda cut herself. Stupidly, I chewed her out that now you can ask for food. They were some political prisoners. Uh, now she looks like this because I never even thought that I could go and ask too because I was the ugly one and she was the pretty one. I'm very sorry about that. You see how they give you a name and then you play the game. So we were going from one place to another as the Americans and the Russians were moving in. And we were in, in a German village, and we were told that if we dare leave the premises, we're gonna be shot right away. So Magda told me, my sister, if I don't get some food, she's gonna die. I didn't have any, any, any respect for the, anybody's property. I went outside and I looked some carrots in the next garden. I was still able to jump like a cat, and I stole the carrots, I stopped myself, I climbed up, it's good to be a gymnast, I climbed up on the wall and I met the guard with a gun who was told to kill. I never had a gun in my life. I hope I never will. And I do support the military because not, they're not there to fight the war. They're there to keep the peace, I hope. But he looked at me in the eye, and I heard the clicking about three times. I actually prayed for him so he wouldn't kill me. And I saw, I don't know if you had any German fathers, 
I saw in his eyes like a father wanted to teach me a lesson and turned the gun around and pushed me inside. And the following day, this is April 1945, when the German people are starving too, and he wanted to know who dared to break the rules, and I crawled to him. He gave me a little loaf of bread. You know what a loaf of bread meant when people were killing for crumbs? And he said to me, you must have been hungry last night for what you did. Wouldn't it be nice if I could meet that man today? Yes, I did find the diamond. Yes, I did. Things were very, very bad, you see, because we ended up in Mauthausen, and I knew I'm going to die there. We stood in front of the crematoria, and then I survived what is called the death march, and I talk about the death march, because if you stopped, you were shot right away. That was close to the end of the war. That was the end of April, and we arrived in a place called Mauthausen, but in the cattle car, my girls were also with me in Auschwitz, and when I danced for Dr. Mengele, I shared the bread with them. And those girls, when they saw me, when they saw me slowing down, they came and they formed a chair with their arms, and they carried me so I wouldn't die. And it is so important that if you were only for the me, 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 you didn't make it. And just like today, all we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now in Gunskirche. I hope you get to see the sound of music, because cannibalism broke out. And when people were eating other people's flesh, I was talking to God to help me, because I didn't want to touch human flesh. And guess what? I looked down, and I had grass to eat. Please see the sound of music because I was there choosing one blade of grass over and against the other. I can't is not in my vocabulary. I can. Why? Because I think I can. And I was choosing even then one blade of grass over the other. So I can't means I'm helpless. But you're not helpless, because yes, you can, and yes, we are here together, and we're going to be so much stronger than me alone or you alone. I was liberated May 4th, 1945. The saints came marching in. I got M&Ms. I was very ill. I was in a hospital. They put me in a cast, and so on. But a while ago, I was getting a call from Fort Carson, Colorado City, from a general for me to come and lecture to the veterans who are coming back from Afghanistan, and 4,000 of them. And when I arrived, I realized that is the home of the 71st Infantry. So you see how things come around, how things come around. And I told them, without that uniform, if you wouldn't have showed up, I never would have been here today. So I'm very grateful, very, very grateful to be here. Yeah, so that's, thank you for bringing up the carrot story, yeah. yeah the other yeah. Thank you. Uh, We only have a few more minutes, but uh, what's also remarkable for me is how under those horrible, horrific circumstances, <laughs> you were able to maintain a sense of humor. Yes. Uh, tell, tell them about the contest you organized. Oh my God, you know about that? <laughs> I told them, I told them to the actual. Uh, we did silly things in Auschwitz, and one day we had a boob contest. That's louder. <laughs> yes, we had a boob contest. <laughs> well, I hate to tell you that I won, but... <laughs> After three children, you know, I wash myself. <laughs> um, oh my God. I also want to tell you that I had two sisters and I never saw my father and I never really wanted to die unless I saw the opposite sex. And in Mauthausen, 
gosh, why do I share that with you? Um, I snuck out at night to watch the dead male bodies. So when I die, I wanted to know how a man looks like. <laughs> I didn't know what you do with it or anything like that. You know, <laughs> but I was just so curious because I wanted to know how a man looks like. Yeah. And uh, so the curiosity here again, and having a second chance in life, and being here with you, I am so fired up, totally fired up. And I think you have to be fired up to shed a light. So I wanna fire you up. I wanna be sure that you're going to take it from this point on, that you're going to just begin a whole wonderful beginning that finally, finally we can survive on this wonderful planet. And I think it's all beginning from this man coming to Flint, Michigan and uh, able to commit himself. This man is a Renaissance man. And in Stanford, you cannot go through Stanford unless you take the class of Dr. Zimbardo. <laughs> That's how popular okay. he has been. So give him, give him, yes. So. So again, as you were told, there's going to be an incredible reception at 6 o'clock. Uh, we want you all to come, uh, because when you come, you can take a <laughs> selfie with, with Edie or, and or with me uh, and ask her all the questions that are obviously in your mind that we didn't have time to discuss now. So I think with that, unless you with want that, to have a, a, final, a final statement. Thank you so much. We love you. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.